talking about? Hypatia, the famous female intellectual and philosopher uh, from the city of Alexandria, which is in Roman Egypt. Uh, she seems to be an anomaly of her age, thriving during a time when so much of what she represented was systematically being rejected by a very changing world around her. Uh, here she is, a pagan woman in a Christian age, dominated by religiously charged power politics rather than ethical concerns. Obviously, nothing like today. <laughs> Hypatia uh, was accepted by the enlightened of all faiths. That's including pagans, Christians, Jews. She was viewed by all of them. Uh, as very wise, and uh, she was a seasoned advisor. Uh, although there were a few, uh, those steeped in the growing suspicions of the age, uh, and uh, who cried out that she must be a vile cultist and using magic to deceive people's minds. But uh, uh, Michael uh, Deacon declares, quote, almost alone, virtually the last academic, she stood for intellectual values, for rigorous mathematics, ascetic Neoplatonism, the crucial role of the mind, and the voice of temperance and moderation in civic life. And unfortunately, uh, the violent uh, public murder of Hypatia by those who failed to understand what she represented truly demonstrated that an age of ignorance had arrived. Uh, the classical world of Greece and Rome was fading fast, and the medieval world and the medieval mentality uh, was about to begin. Uh, of course, obviously, uh, she was born around 350. We'll go into that evidence in a little bit, and was murdered in 415. But it's time for me to start blowing your mind. <laughs> We've heard so much about Hypatia, and uh, one thing I want to mention, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, she is an anomaly amongst female philosophers in antiquity. You know, that this was unprecedented. It was not commonplace. I got to tell you a secret. You have been lied to. There are so many female philosophers from antiquity. It's unbelievable. In fact, just for fun, I'm going to mention a few. Let's go. All right, so let's see. Well, we uh, here's the short list. We have Themistia from the sixth century BCE, known as the philosopher priestess of Delphi and one of Pythagoras's teachers. We have Theano from the sixth century, the wife of Pythagoras and philosopher in her own right. We have Amo, uh, the daughter of Pythagoras and also philosopher. We have Mia, another daughter of Pythagoras, trained as a philosopher. We have Eric Nocte. Uh, from the uh, the fourth, uh, sorry, fifth century, we have the Pythagorean philosopher uh, Abratilia, how about Apasia, one of the teachers of Socrates or Diatima? What about uh, uh, Esclepinia? How about that? Or what about Erete of Cyrene? Huh, let's see. What about uh, Nicerte of Megara? What about Phoenus? What about Extenia? What about Lasthenia? What about Themacali? What about um, Parkia, are you getting my point yet? What about Latina? What about Baptist? Uh, Lampsacus, who's a famous Epicurean philosopher, or Theomesta of Lampsacus, or what about Ptolemaeus of Cyrene, or what about Maria, Prophetessima, or what about uh, Julia Dama, what about Catherine of Alexandria? Are you getting my point yet? Tosapata of Ephesus, which I'd love to do a talk on sometime. Because she has lots of information. Macrina the Younger. Hmm, let's see. You got my point yet? The point is, we have been lied to. We There are tons of female philosophers. There are so many, it's ridiculous. And the ancient world talks about them all the time. We even have their writings. We even have a, a, a work on how to breastfeed the Pythagorean way by one of the daughters of Pythagoras. It gets ridiculous. There's so much, but the problem is, is a lot of the, these materials are not translated into English or for German for that matter. They're still in Greek. So we have a lot to work to do. So the problem is our side. We need to be doing our work and translating and bringing these works 
Otherwise, we have this misshapen idea of ancient times where it's a bunch of men sitting around walking in philosopher's robes when that is not the truth. If you read the primary sources, is this interesting? Did I just blow your mind, right? And it makes me upset. Actually, I, I abbreviated the list. The list, I actually cut it in half. So I thought you guys are getting tired of hearing names. <laughs> so many. And it's not just names. We have writings behind it, too. So I encourage you, if you're interested in something like this, to go into this field and write this wrong. And unfortunately, I do blame classicists, too. Sometimes they are too patriarchal. They're too male-oriented. And they don't, they have, the, in a sense, this little curtain there where they don't want to go into this. I ran into this at UCI when I was in the classics department. And you're going to see lots of patriarchy there. So do you guys feel better? All right. You already, you already felt like you walked away with something, didn't you? Yeah. And some inspiration. Okay. So Hypatia is not uh, the exception. Uh, but in fact, there's, she, she, there's one even at the same time as her. Uh, uh, her, uh, her name is Adesia uh, uh, of Alexandria, who's a Neoplatonist philosopher. They're Pythagoreans, they're Epicureans, they're all types. There's even a few Stoic ones thrown in for good measure, because why not? Uh, but still, so Hypatia is not unique in that sense, but she's unique in a few other ways, because she does turn out to be one of the last, uh, except for, except for uh, uh, Adesia, who I just mentioned, uh, after her and Adacia, all of a sudden we have this vacuum, especially in the West. And then all of a sudden, in the 11th century, we start having a few more and it starts up again. So she is the last of her age. But let's not ever think that, you know, she's the exception to the rule. Uh, she is just the last of so many uh, who follow along her line. Of course, um, uh, we have to ask a few other questions. Um, so the question moves to what forces were at work to make Hypatia one of the last great female thinkers of antiquity, and what she represents as a figure of transition. What political, uh, religious, or social forces were happening during the fourth century that diminished the female voice within intellectual circles, or at least suppressed them? And what was this influence related to? And how, well, how was it related to even Christianity? So let's, let's talk about the fact of the age in which she was born. Well, uh, I have to say that 50 years before she was born, the Roman Empire, it was a pagan empire. Uh, it was under Diocletian, uh, who declared uh, that he was Lord and God. Uh, you have the imperial cult clearly in control. He was, he was known as the Pontifex Maximus. He was head of the Roman public religion, and that was the imperial paganism of that time. Uh, obviously, uh, you have what's called the Tetrarchy. We're not going to go into it. However, the point is the Roman Empire uh, was divided up in order to make it uh, more administratively manageable uh, at that time. But then, of course, you're going to have uh, uh, Constantine the Great. And Constantine the Great, uh, what will happen here is that uh, in the year um, 311, he supposedly had a vision of a cross. Uh, Hopwicus, you know, in this, you conquer. And so he goes about, he fights Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge. There's this big battle. Uh, Maxentius is lost. <laughs> and... Uh, and so he declares, of course, that maybe this cross, this magic sign uh, that was put on in some versions uh, on the standards, in other versions on the shields, you got to pay attention to the various versions. Uh, this cross had this magic power, but Constantine in no way is a Christian. He's only a Christian upon his baptism on his deathbed. And he doesn't act like a Christian at all. <laughs> we, we always get things mixed up. We think Constantine's the guy that makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman uh, world. That is not true. The person is Theodosius I. Always Theodosius. It's never Constantine. So I'm sorry, Da Vinci Code, you're wrong. <laughs> and all those books that say that, they're wrong too. Uh, and and uh, what will happen then uh, is that there will be an agreement 
Uh, the Edict of Milan, uh, which will be in 313. Uh, the Edict of Milan basically is an agreement to tolerate all religions, inclusive of Christianity, and it makes Constantine the Pontifex Maximus, he is head of the Roman religion, which is inclusive of Christianity, but not only Christianity. Uh, but the problem is, here we go, is that immediately uh, Christians go, hey, you know what? Uh, during the time of persecutions, we're not sure what to do. If we should let those people who def you know went against our faith, should we allow them back to go in into our churches? Should we have them come back? We can't make a, make a decision. And so they're all fighting amongst themselves. Constantine was thinking, hey, you know what? I want to... You know, take advantage of Christianity because they have such a great network. You know, I mean, they can care of the poor, hungry, needy, great infrastructure. I can save money too. But now it turns out Christians are all fighting each other. So he says, okay, let's make a decision. In 314, he calls the Council of Arles. Nobody should have come, but they all arrived. And he says to the church, let them all back in. Well, what this does is put the Pope here and the Emperor here. You guys got it? Creating a precedent. So that when they start fighting over something else, uh, they do, of course, and that's called Arianism. Uh, it's not have nothing to do with the Arian race. Has it has everything to do with Arius? And Arius uh, basically says as follows: uh, He's from Alexandria. Don't worry, we're getting a Hypatia or creating a context. Uh, he basically says that uh, uh, since Christ was begotten, born of the Father, there was a time when he was not, and if there was a time when he was not. This means Christ is limited, and if he is limited, he is not fully God, and so therefore he was less than the Father, and perhaps even a creature of the Creator. And this is a belief system known as Arianism. And now it rocks the whole world, and so guess what happens? Constantine goes, hey, let's have a council. <laughs> so uh, so he does uh, have a council. Uh, and of course, this is the, uh, the famous um, um, 325, uh, to, sorry, the, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, and at this council, uh, he makes a decision, and basically that is, he goes against Arius. And um, he, he makes his decision uh, in his palace. It's kind of cool. I've been to his palace. It's partly underwater, so I've actually swum. Uh, swum? It's not even a word. Uh, I actually went swimming uh, in, in the area where that decision was made. You just got to watch out for Turkish kids uh, making cannonballs above you on the wall and they may hit you. Uh, yes, I always say to myself, wouldn't it be fun to take a tour and go swimming in the old council chambers, which are off of his neck. But anyway, moving right along, fun digression. So what will happen now is eventually, here we go, Christianity uh, uh, decides that maybe Arianism is good. So they kind of reverse themselves in three years. What does it have to do with uh, Hypatia? Pretty much everything. Because she is born in Alexandria around 350. And what's happening at this time is Constantius, the son of, of Constantine the Great, has decided that Christianity should be Arianism. And it won in 350. In fact, they beat out everybody. Constance lost, you know, he died. Are you using it? You know, so now it's all Arian. And that means at the time when Hypatia was born, uh, you're going to have religious strife, not between Christians and pagans, but between Christians and Christians. Okay? He's growing in, up in a time where Christians are at each other's throats. And pagans are kind of going, okay, hey, I'm glad you're leaving us alone. <laughs> so that is the context. Okay, so when she was born, okay, so what happens uh, is that, uh, um, uh, uh, of course, I can go into the evidence of why it's not 370 as opposed to 350. I can go into all the evidence there, but we don't have a lot of time, so we'll skip that paragraph. But so we know that she's born around 350. As a little girl, Hypatia would observe the horrendous persecutions of Constantius against the Nicene Christians that continued way after his death in 361. So basically, when she's growing up as a little girl in Alexandria, I want you to imagine this scene, okay? So what happens is those people who profess the Nicene Creed, right, as opposed to Arianism, 
In Alexandria, this is what's happening. Nicene Christians were beaten to unrecognized forms by thorn palm branches and then flung out into the desert. Their bodies were left to rot where they fell and refused burials. Women who followed the Nicene Creed as opposed to Arianism were stripped, threatened with flames and whipped. They attacked the orphanages and the places for widows. They were seized in the cemeteries. There appeared to be no escape. Lots of gore, lots of blood. This is the impression that Hypatia would have seen of the world when she's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten years old. It is Christians against Christians, killing each other constantly. And, and she realized this is something she does not want to be a part of. Now we're, we're understanding her context. This is good, right? You know, they don't show love to one another. Why should I be a part of this, right? So this is a sad moment historically, but, but there you have it. Well, Constantius dies in 361, and Julian, uh, who's a pagan, takes over uh, from 361 to 363. And the pagans are all, yay, this is great, uh, you know? But what happens is that um, on February 4, 362, Julian decides that he's going to issue edicts against the Christians. What? Now he's seeing pagans. Now she's seeing pagans. Are you getting this? You know, uh, starting to do restrictions against Christians. And it gets really bad. But then he dies, right? And after that, Jovian takes over. Jovian, from 363 to 364, says, you know what? We're going to get back at those pagans. And so now he declares paganism as illegal. He burns the library of Antioch down to the ground and does all these horrendous activities. Antioch, not Alexandria. And the other person, so, so Hypatia is kind of like, okay, what is going on, right? Fortunately, when Valentinian I, 364 to 375, and balance take over 364 to 378 they start to really kind of tolerate most there's not there's some persecutions here and there but for the most part the world is tired of, of persecutions and this is a period of time where now pagans are allowed to move up into high positions for example you have uh themistius uh who's the head of the library of constantinople uh he never had to apologize for his beliefs as a pagan he was the director. Uh, he commanded a legion of librarians as well as copyists. Uh, and uh, he had so many important works copied and saved from antiquity. So this is her world. Okay. Now, as we move through here, Hypatia, uh, by this point, had decided to abandon the idea of marriage or family. And she decided that she is, doesn't want to be connected to uh, to any family life whatsoever. She wants to focus in 100% on being a philosopher, following in the footsteps of her father, known as Theon of Alexandria. Theon of Alexandria, according to the primary sources, was connected to what's called the Museum of Alexandria. And so was she. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The Museum of Alexandria is the Library of Alexandria. It's the same. We talked, we had to talk about this before, the Library of Alexandria, you know, you had two of them, you know, so, so when one was destroyed, the other survived. So at this time, the museum is a location uh, that is uh, connected uh, to the Temple of Serapis, right? And, uh, but there will be another one that will be developed uh, shortly. But we know specifically he is a man from the museum. Thien was one of, the, one of the last important members. Uh, Thien was very busy. He's very much into mathematics. He edited, for example, Euclid's Elements, creating the official version that would not be replaced until the 19th century. Did you guys hear that? Thien, the father, uh, created this version. So the version that Abraham Lincoln, remember Abraham Lincoln, he had three favorite books, uh, the Bible, the works of William Shakespeare, and Euclid's Geometry. A little bit of quiz. Uh, but, uh, and so the version that he read was the, the version 
uh, that was annotated by Theon of Alexandria with the help of his daughter. <laughs> so, okay, so we're starting to, our eyes are starting to open up, but we're seeing these connections, okay? So, what happened? Uh, Theon uh, wrote uh, many commentaries uh, on Euclid's data and optics, uh, Ptolemy's Almagest. Uh, he also wrote a treatise on the astrolabe, which will be heavily cited uh, later on in the Latin West. Uh, Theon's works uh, on the astrolabe would be so important that it would be the definitive work of how to work an astrolabe uh, and when it's the Muslim world, and it's still basically the same idea. So Theon's legacy goes on, but guess what? Guess who also helped him? Again, his daughter. So her influence is moving through, okay? Theon also carried on some of the occult knowledge of the Library of Alexandria, but those works are not there anymore. On signs and observations of birds and sounds of crows, it doesn't sound that interesting. I'm not sure if I want to read a book on, on, on crows, but you know, whatever. Uh, there's a work on the rising of the dog star. That sounds interesting. And of course, on the inundation of the Nile, too bad we don't have them. Uh, there's no denial about that. Well, there is a denial about that, but whatever. Um, he also uh, uh, connected to works connected to, yes, the Corpus Hermeticum. Uh, so there's a few commentaries that have survived. Uh, he looked into, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the seven spheres, uh, uh, Joe, Mars, Venus, the moon, Saturn, the sun, Mercury, and how it relates to destiny. Uh, and, he, and about fate, and how all of these powers are subsumed under what's called the Aeon, the Lord of Unchangeable Laws of the Universe. Uh, we have this. I, I do have to tell you, uh, Aeon is a devoted Neoplatonist. I know many of you are going, do we have to hear about Neoplatonism? Yes, we do. <laughs> because that's what Hypatia is all about, and dad's into that as well. Uh, he wrote other works in praise of the genius of Ptolemy. Uh, and of course, the duality of heaven versus nature, uh, spirit or ether versus matter. Uh, and also uh, Theon in his language, as we have read, because its extent, much of it is close to what's called the Orphic Mysteries. So you're going to have influences now for I Hypatia, Neoplatonism, Right? So Hermeticism, Orphic Mysteries, all of this she's involved in, and we know that all of this she's not only involved in, she's helping dad with these works. <laughs> so she has a vested interest. Don't worry, he does finally give her recognition. We'll, I'll read that, that a little bit later. I told you this is going to be fun. <laughs> so, uh, so Theon of Alexandria and his daughter Hartatia, realized the world was changing pretty fast in the late fourth century, especially for those who did not profess Christianity. And so there arose an emperor by the name of Theodosius I. He reigned from 379 to 395. Theodosius, that's the guy you want to throw all the stuff on the anti-pagan. He's the guy, not Constantine. <laughs> Constantine only destroyed five pagan temples in his entire life. And, uh, and you know, and the reason were happened to be uh, quite a few, but nothing to do with against paganism. <laughs> so, but it is Theodosius who is the one who is pretty dramatic. Um, Theodosius decreed on June 16th, hey, I'm giving you an actual date, <laughs> June 16th, 391 CE, uh, decreed that public pagan worship in any form was now forbidden with sacrifices to cease immediately. According to what? The Codex of Theodosius. How's that for a source? <laughs> okay. According to Socrates Scholasticus, um, uh, who is a contemporary, uh, for Theophilus, the Bishop of Alexandria, this edict was not harsh enough, but decided to go further and order all the temples of the city of Alexandria to be destroyed. So once again, so the Emperor Theodosius makes, makes his decree, and then the Patriarch 
of Alexandria goes a little bit further and makes it a little worse. Well, remember, remember, Hypatia is living in Alexandria at this time when all these temples are being destroyed, right? And there were riots, right? Uh, lots of riots. Uh, he's not a very nice guy. The first thing he does, however, is he wants to fight other Christians. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you, uh, uh, Theophilus of, of Antioch, uh, he's not a very nice guy. He, he, there's a this belief system called organism. I won't go into it. And many of the monks uh, were into this mystical form of, of, of Christianity, which uh, ba basically said that the universe kind of always kind of reestablishes itself over and over again. And uh, Lucifer or Satan can be forgiven uh, in the end. And because God's love is supposed to be irresistible, and since God's love is, is, is irresistible, then obviously even Satan can't resist it in the end. And then he's and then he's forgiven, and then the whole world cycle repeats itself over and over again. That's originism. Doesn't that sound kind of interesting? Anyway, so what happens uh, is that uh, uh, he actually supports the originists, and then they went against him politically, and then he decided he's against them because they won't support him. And so he slaughtered in mass 10,000 of their followers. That's a lot of people. Wiped out. Blood running everywhere around the Theobod. Is this interesting? So he's, he's terrible to his own Christians. So obviously uh, he's going to be the same uh, with uh, uh, pagans. Oh, also, maybe you've, maybe you've heard of John Chrysostom. Uh, he got poor John Chrysostom. He's considered like the big saint of the Eastern Orthodox Church to this day, the Greek Orthodox. Uh, he got him deposed from office in 403 uh, a CE. He actually got John Chrysostom exiled. So this guy is a mean man. He's bad. <laughs> He's as bad as it can be. And, and of course, he has the Temple of Serapis destroyed. So this great Temple of Serapis that does have part of the Library of Alexandria, uh, it is so beautiful. It was destroyed there, completely destroyed. I have the primary sources. Rufinius says, however, a belief had been spread about by the Gentiles themselves that if a human hand was laid violently on this statue, being Serapis, the earth would immediately open up, dissolving into the chaos, and suddenly the heavens would collapse into the abyss. This story gave people a senseless pause when, behold, one of the soldiers, better protected by his faith than by his weapons, seized a double-edged axe, stood up with all his strength, and struck the jaw of the old man of the statue. A shout was raised by both groups of people, but neither the sky fell nor the earth sunk. Repeating his actions several times, he cut off the worm-eaten uh, uh, wood blackened by smoke once it was cast down and thrown into the fire and it burnt as easily as dry wood, after which the head was taken, having been torn away from its neck with its body is broken. Then the feet and the other limbs were cut off in pieces by blows of the axe, quartered and dragged off to the aid with the aid of ropes. Then in each locale, member by member, the decrepit old man was burned under the eyes of adoring Alexandria. Finally, the trunk, which still remained, was burned in the amphitheater. Such was the end of the main superstition and the ancient air of Serapis. It's, yeah, there's another story. It's one of my favorites. Pretty messed up. Is, is, is that the, it's a monk uh, that destroyed the statue. But when he hit it with the axe, all these rats attacked him. <laughs> and they crawl out. He runs from all the rats uh, that had been hiding within the wooden statue. But the temple, it, it tore it down all the way to its foundations, uh, and nothing was left. Nothing was left. So that's the end of the Library of Alexandria? No, guess what? We know from primary sources, there's still a museum in existence. I love librarians, don't you? Aren't they great? They really are, because, because they always have a backup. <laughs> so when they destroyed this one, they had another one. <laughs> so it was still going on, and it continues on into the 5th century. You guys feel better? Uh, and Synetheus and a few others do refer to it. So we, we do know it did exist, and we have letters that talk about it and stuff. Okay, okay, so what about Hypatia? I mean, this guy is a monster. 
right? Theophilus, of, uh, uh, Theophilus is, is terrible. Is doing all these terrible activities, you know? You would think that she would be pretty messed up. She's left completely alone. What? She's left completely alone. While all this is going on, nobody touches her. In fact, her reputation during this period of time increases. Her prestige also increases. This is why we're talking about the context of this time. She becomes more popular than ever, despite the fact that all these pagan temples are being destroyed, despite the fact of this edict. Do you find that interesting? She is an anomalous kind of figure, right? So what happened uh, is that um, uh, she was part of the Platonic school in the Museum of Alexandria. Hypatia taught many subjects. Guess what? We know what subjects. I'll tell you the subjects. Yeah. Uh, how do we know what subjects? Because she has students, and we have the letters of the students, and the students talk about what subjects she, she taught. How's that? So here we go. She taught, uh, not my favorite topic, but mathematics is number one. She was a great mathematician. She taught astronomy. She taught literature classes. And she taught philosophy. Don't worry. I actually have a book list uh, that she would recommend. So you can write that later on. You guys haven't? Yeah, okay. We know the museum, of course, existed. Uh, the daughter, uh, they call the Daughter Museum. Uh, Sneetheus does mention uh, this, this uh, museum in his work in Praise of Baldness in the 5th century. I think that's a great book that everybody should read. What do you think in Praise of Baldness? Anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, now, according to the Suda, Hypatia, I'm quoting, was, quote, exceedingly beautiful and fair of form, I'm quoting. In speech, articulate and logical. In her actions, prudent and public-spirited. And the rest of the city gave her a suitable welcome and accorded her special respect. So here she is. She's beautiful, right? Uh, she, is, uh, she speaks very well. We know more about her as well. In fact, Osmethia says that she has, quote, a very sweet sounding voice, which is interesting. We'll talk about that here. Uh, according for, uh, to Damascus in his life of Isidore, we know that in her dress, Hypatia wore the clothes of a philosopher. Uh, he states, donning the philosopher's cloak, the tribon, and making her way through the midst of the city, she explained publicly the writings of Plato, or Aristotle, or any other philosopher, unquote. Yet while she was public, uh, she, while she was the public forum for much of her time, she was also a very private individual in other areas. In fact, she taught certain what are called philosophical mysteries to an inner circle, for she believed that it was, quote, not right for the unclean to handle that which was impure, unquote. Told you you're going to get good stuff. As for Hypatia's personal life, Suda uh, says, you all heard this story. I'll give you stuff you never heard before, but we all heard this. Uh, Hypatia remained, quote, a virgin, scaring away a potential uh, by handling, by handing him her, uh, somebody fell in love with her. And so she, what she basically did is handed him her menstrual uh, regs and put it in her, put it on his hand, and declared that there was nothing beautiful about the physical body and the lusts of the flesh. And of course, you know, he's sitting there holding her menstrual blood, and maybe he's starting to agree. This account originally came from Damascus, wherein the man happened to be one of her students who had fallen in love with her. Hypatia felt she had to do her best to dissuade him as much as possible for, from pursuing her by revealing to him that while her spirit may be divinely influenced, her flesh was as human as anybody else and subject to corruption and the flaws of nature 
and its material impurities. As she handed him, his, uh, handed, handed him her menstrual rag, she declared, uh, quote, this is really what you love, my young man, but you do not love beauty for its own sake, unquote. <laughs> you tell him, Hypatia. Hypatia was referring here to what is called uh, the Greek eros love, using the word eros, knowing that the student found her to be beautiful in a physical way and still lusted after her. We know that Hypatia's views of the physical body were the same as Plotinus, the famous uh, 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 Neoplatonist, who states as follows, when a man sees the beauty in bodies, he must not run after them. We must know that they are images, traces, shadows, and hurry away to that which they image. For if a man runs to the image and wants to seize it as if it was a reality, then this man who clings to beautiful bodies and does not let them go sinks down into the dark depths where the intellect has no delight and stays blind in Hades and sorting with shadows here and there. Uh, no, for Hypatia, this man was to delight in her intellect and ultimate beauty and not in her temporary and fleeting beauty of her flesh, her image, which she believed would go away someday. She wanted real permanence, and that is permanence of the love of the spirit, which she taught in other places. We're going to get some of her, her teachings, some taking this in. Right? Damascus mentions that there is another version of the story whereby Hypatia convinces him against pursuing a relationship uh, through a musical expression, but we don't know the details of this. Socrates Scholasticus, what a great, you know, I like that name. You know, if you have a kid, you should name your kid Socrates Scholasticus. That kid will do no wrong, right? <laughs> Except for grammar. Uh, because if you think about it, I mean, Socrates Scholasticus, I don't know. Um, he lived from 380 to 430 CE. So he is a direct contemporary of Hypatia. So this is really, this, this is even a better primary source. He wrote as follows about her, quote, here we go, I'm quoting him. And remember, he lives at the same time. There was a woman at Alexandria named Hypatia, daughter of the philosopher Theon, who made such attainments in literature and science as to far surpass all the philosophers of her own time. Having succeeded to the school of Plato and Plotinus, well, that's pretty primary, she explained the principles of philosopher, philosophy excuse me, to her auditors, many of whom came from a distance to receive her instructions. On account of the self-possession and ease of manner that she had acquired in consequence of the cultivation of her mind, she not infrequently appeared in public in the presence of the magistrates. Neither did she feel abashed in going to an assembly of men, for all men, on account of her extraordinary dignity and virtue, admired her all the more. <laughs> I love that. And she's doing this during the time of, 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 uh, Theop of Theophilus of Antioch. Uh, sorry, it's like the office of, of, of Alexandria. She's doing it at the same time as Theodosius the Great. This is the time when pagans are not doing too well. And what's happening? She is not being censored. She's going into the forum of men and speaking her mind and not thinking anything about it. What a powerful woman, right? Think about it, right? Think how brave she is. And she does so casually. She just walks right into the assembly and says, hey, you know, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. How's that for a primary source? Is this good? Right? Oh, okay. As documented through the letters of, of her sources, including Snethius, you're going you're gonna to hear his name quite often. It's S-Y-N-E-S-I-U-S. -S. We know that she had disciples from all over the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and they arrived in Alexandria just to become 
her disciples. Sometimes staying with her for two to three years, while other of her disciples stayed with her for 14 to 15 years. Wow, that's a long time. Right? We know where they're from. The Theobod in Egypt, from Cyrene in North Africa, from Constantinople, from Syria. Can you imagine? So she created uh, this, this, this great school, uh, the school, of course, of Platonism and of mysticism. So, of course, you're going to ask, what are her teachings? Well, I have them. Following her father's esteemed legacy, Hypatia was a proud Neoplatonist. Following the teachings of Plotinus, like the revered father of Neoplatonism, Hypatia taught that it was possible to enter into a mystical union with the divine, often asserting that this union was possible through the study of mathematics and logic in connection with nature. Hypatia believed that, quote, from her students, Nethius, astronomy is itself a divine form of knowledge, unquote. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm quoting her. <laughs> so astronomy is one of the ways to get into this mystical form of knowledge. Uh, Snethia says this in his, his ad uh, piconium. Later in, uh, in reflection of the importance of understanding astronomy as a gateway to mystical knowledge, uh, Snethius also writes concerning her as follows. I consider it a science that opens up the way to the ineffable theology, unquote. Astronomy was the perfect pursuit for Hypatia, for it incorporated two of the disciplines she loved so well and was proficient at, that being mathematics uh, in general and geometry in particular. Snethius also shared the passion of both these topics uh, with Hypatia in regards to the application of math and astronomy and declares of his disciple, and it proceeds to its demonstrations clearly and distinctly, making use of arithmetic and geometry as helpers, disciplines which can probably be, be, be called a fixed measure of truth. Hypatia loves math. <laughs> she does. And when I keep mentioning Snethius, what happens, we have seven letters written by Snethius to her. They had a correspondence. So I'm, what I'm, I'm getting this from both of them. Is this good? So we know this conversation. We know uh, she's really into astronomy and mathematics. And for you guys into astronomy and mathematics, yay. <laughs> you can see why a lot of classicists and those people who are in the humanities go, oh, please. <laughs> see, see, I told you I'm going to give you everything about Hypatia. Uh, it may be Monday, but hey, you guys want it? I'm going to give it to you, right? Okay, so there it is. She loves math. Maybe the aftermath, too. Her, oh, here it is. You want, uh, we do have a reading list because she taught with her, her students of uh, books that you have to read. So I'm going to give you books that Hypatia wants you to read. Do this be kind of fun to have kind of a course on Hypatia, you know? Okay, so here it is. Um, you have to read all the writings of Plato. Everyone. All the writings of Aristotle. Okay, we figured that out. I know. Euclid. Okay, that's fine. Commentaries on Euclid. Okay. Plotinus and the Aeneids. Okay, so that's Peripheries, Life of Plotinus. Oh, wait a minute. That's more specific. Sure is. Materials related to the pre-Socratic philosopher Pythagoras. He highly recommended, uh, she highly recommended the life of Pythagoras. She recommended both the version written by Porphyry and the version written by Amblichus. I Amblichus, wow, it is. He, she also recommended Eunapius' life of philosophers, as well as the writings of Hermas Trismegistus and also the Chaldean oracles. So there you go. Uh, that's her reading list, so get started. Uh, this is what she had to read. Um, now, the, the founder of Neoplatonism, Plotinus, uh, remember this is her philosophy because she's a, she is a um, Neoplatonist, taught the idea of the good 
and ultimate monad, the one. This one is never divisible in itself, which was equal to Plato's beauty and the good, and was prior to all existence. That which first emanates from this one, from this monad, this thing that emanates is called the noose. This noose, uh, you're going to follow this because we're going to go somewhere with it. This noose that comes from the one, almost like the father and the son. Uh, okay, see how she gets away with things. Okay, so this one, right, emanates the noose, right, emanates it, which was the divine mind, also known as the logos or the demiurge, that in turn emanates the world soul, the lower part of the soul being nature. So basically, she taught a trinity. You got the one, the monad, that which emanates from it, which is the demiurge, right? Or the logos. And that, of course, which was nature. So what will happen is that many of her Christian students will simply say, the monad is father. The noose, the emanating aspect, is the son. And the, and the nature aspect is the Holy Spirit. and so. That's how you kind of get away with it. Is that interesting? So, so she taught a tripartite idea. Um, of course, she taught that human souls then arrive out from this nature. Finally, the lowest aspect of all matter in the material world resides at the very bottom rung of the emanations. But she taught that through the effort of intellectual contemplation, one could achieve mystical and ecstatic union with the one which she will talk about, and I'll quote about it in a little bit. So, so if you can contemplate in a certain way with a certain amount of focus, you can move from the material realm, realize that you are a stranger in a strange land, that your spirit is here so journey, and uh, realize this enlightenment, really enlightenment, and become part of the one, the chorus in song uh, and in beauty. Sorry, I got excited there. So, good stuff, <laughs> right? Uh, um, now, how one was able to achieve this union with God was through a special kind of knowledge, which she taught, received via the personal experience of the power of the monad as well as nature. Once this is established, a foundation is formed uh, for all existence. The power of the monad transcends, transcends what the mind can grasp, and the physical form can reach through its own exercises. Uh, so intellectual contemplation is what she taught, the intellect and mind. And through this effort, we can move to the divine through theorea. And this is likened to an ecstatic experience. This is what she wanted every one of her students to do. This is part of her inner mysteries. Don't tell anybody. Okay. Okay. All right, so because she was both a Neoplatonist philosopher and a mystic, she often delved into other mysteries shunned by many. In fact, later on, her mystical knowledge became demonized by certain Christians. Uh, John of Nikio, uh, who wrote three centuries later in the seventh century, declares that she was uh, devoted at all times. This is three centuries later, okay? She was devoted at all times to magic astrolobes and instruments of music and she beguiled many people through her satanic wiles yeah okay yeah, this is three centuries later uh you know not not that taboo during her time uh part of of course uh she did have um very much into the hybrid egyptian greek uh version of the chaldean oracles the hermetic writings hypatia uh did uh teach uh the teachings of Hermas of Trismegistus, but we don't have time, we'll go to that. She also taught concerning the Chaldean oracles. In fact, Sneetheus later on reveals his intimate knowledge of them in various hymns that he had learned from her and in his work on dreams. The Chaldean oracles uh, basically got started way back in the second century CE. It has many similarities uh, to uh, Neoplatonism. And so basically, you'd still have a kind of a, a tripartite division of power. First of all, you have uh, the all high uh, deity called Father, uh, within which resides what is called power, 
or this creative energy. And then accordingly, there's an emanation known as intellect that radiates from this power and contemplates the forms of the All High Father. And then as a result of this connection, uh, uh, you're going to have the, uh, the realization uh, of what's called Hecate, uh, the fire, the material realm, uh, and it goes on from there. But it's, it's basically a tripartite division. Uh, so you have Father, Hecate, and intellect. Hecate is viewed as the mother, uh, and this is what emanates the world soul, which in turn emanates nature, but it's, and of course then fate. But it's, it's all similar to the Neoplatonism. You guys got it? But we don't, it's a whole nother talk. <laughs> okay. But there's more. All right. As far as her works are concerned, oh, Hypatia wrote many works. For example, she wrote a commentary, a 13 volume Arithmetica by Diophantus of Alexandria. She wrote a commentary. So this guy by the name of Diophantus wrote this work, get this, on arithmetic, and she made a commentary in 13 volumes. <laughs> so maybe a little bit voracious in her writing. Uh, of course, Diophantus is often known as the father of algebra. Algebra. Not too long. Many scholars noted that that Diophantus's Arithmetica that survives today happens to be the commentary written by Hypatia. What did, what did he just say? The form of algebra that goes into the East and comes back is her work. <laughs> How's that? Because <laughs> nobody could understand him. Theon had trouble understanding him. <laughs> so she broke him down and made him decipherable. So what do you think of that for a legacy? Well, if you hate algebra, maybe not. But if you love algebra, it, it, we still have that. Is this good? All right. Uh, like her father, Hypatia was interested in, in Ptolemy's Almagest. Uh, and uh, he, she also um, uh, helped him with his, uh, his work. In fact, um, he finally gave her notice. Uh, he wrote the commentary by Theon of Alexandria on book three of Pablo's Amagest, edition revised by my daughter, Hypatia, the philosopher. There we go. Yeah, she gets credit. <laughs> and finally gives her credit on this work. I think that's sweet, but she should have done this a long time ago. But uh, uh, there you have it. Uh, and so this work survives today. You know, wow, we, we have works by Hypatia and we didn't know about it. Well, how come nobody ever, because nobody ever reads these kind of works, it's mathematics. <laughs> now you're following my, my drift in general, right? But there's more. Uh, for scholars also realized uh, that uh, she worked on other works, uh, her own work on Ptolemy's Amagest as well. Uh, in fact, um, by the way, in honor, uh, Hypatia also edited her father's commentary on Euclid's Elements. You, you, know, the, you know the one that uh, he gets credit for, that Abraham Lincoln read up to the 19th century? Yeah, she revised his work. <laughs> so that's kind of her work too. So if you get that old version, you get her as well. Uh, and uh, in this work, she was also, she was all, also this, she was interested in conics. Apollyonis of Perga, she was very much interested in the movements of the earth. Now we don't know if she believed that the earth went around the sun. We don't know that. That's, that's part of the, I know the, the movie, uh, Agora, that she decided to, to seem to be almost at that point. We have no evidence for it. We just know that she studied conics, and she wrote on conics, and she wrote on orbits and so forth, but we don't know if she finally came to that revelation. But we do know that she did read the works connected to the person who did of Perge. We do know that she had knowledge of that. Um, at one point, Damascius compares Hypatia to Isidore, saying that in comparing her to him was like comparing a mathematician against a true philosopher. <laughs> Hypatia was also 
uh, known uh, for other works as well. And she, excuse me, uh, worked on what's called a hydrometer or a hydrometer. We know this uh, from her letters uh, to Smetheus. Uh, basically, uh, this is kind of a, uh, this is a hydrometer uh, determines the relative density of liquids. She made a better one, and her student, Synetheus, asked her to make one especially for him. So that was nice. So she was kind of an inventor as well. Now, who were those who, uh, who came to visit her, who were her students? They came from all over the place. We have their names. Uh, I have all their names here. I'm not sure if I want to mention each one, but I'll, I'll mention a few. Okay. One of her main uh, students, of course, was Smetheus and Sarini, already mentioned, who maintained a constant correspondence with her uh, and her other pupils under her direct instruction. Even after his time of instruction under her tutelage, Smetheus and Hypatia continued their correspondence. Uh, he was born around 373 CE uh, in Libya. And he went to Alexandria as a youth and met Hypatia around the year 392, 393, where he became a disciple of Hypatia and studied Neoplaton as well as alchemy under her guidance. guidance. So she was a well-known alchemist as well. At one point, Smetheus declared, today Egypt has received and cherishes the fruitful wisdom of Hypatia, unquote. Isn't that sweet? Uh, Smetheus believed God brought them together. Uh, he says in Epistle 137, he considers himself as now amongst, quote, the company of the blessed, the most holy, and revered of the gods, unquote. Uh, Epistle 143. Well, that's, um, he's a Christian, and he, he declares her what? The most holy and revered of the gods? Wow, that is interesting. Hypatia asserted that they were now a family to view one another as one in spirit and in mind. She pointed that beyond her, they were to revere the divine laws that as Nethius notes, quote, demand that we who are united through intellect, the best thing within us, and so should honor one another, unquote. Isn't that, so they are a family, but they are to esteem the intellect and now understanding the context of Neoplatonism, you understand this also connects with mental and ecstatic ascent, which she does also talk about. So they make this union, in a sense, with the divine in her mystical groups. Speaking about her organizational skills, uh, if you're going to her school, uh, Hypatia organized everybody into groups of four. She believed that four uh, representing uh, Pythagorean uh, Tetrax was uh, was uh, important. So what she would do is that when you enter her school, you had to pick three other people and that's your study group. And you should be with them, not only during that time of study, but have a bond with one another throughout the rest of your life. And that is to be like your family. Now, what if you get stuck with a bad study buddy? And by the way, we do have writings about people getting stuck with some. Well, then you could quickly change to somebody else. You have to be comfortable with that. But four was the basic idea. Um, uh, so for him, Snethius, his, his, his were happened to be Hypatia, uh, Heraclinus, uh, and Olympias. So, so that's his little group. And Hesychus. And Hypatia, of course, was, a, was the fifth one because she was teaching. You know. So uh, that was his little group. So that means that Snethius is writing them back and forth all the rest of his life. He doesn't have much in common with a few of them, but he tries his best. One, one was really much into breeding horses. He's like, oh, okay, but I got to write this guy because he's part of our group. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. Uh, anyway, it's <laughs> made clear Hypatia revealed the inner mysteries to him and his fellow students, mystical revelations only imparted following the swearing of a pledge that was observed at her school with their own eyes, quote, and heard, quote, with their own ears and was to be kept 
secret, for Sneetheus adds, quote, to explain philosophy to the mob is only to awaken among men a great contempt of things divine, unquote. So there is a secret uh, rituals that they followed. Uh, Sneetheus later on with the uh, 395 with the Athens, studied there in 399. He was not impressed. Uh, and so uh, he went to Constantinople, but eventually he ended up back with her. We have this really long letter, which I'm not going to read, <laughs> from Smetheus that shows that um, uh, he was initiated in the Eleusian Mysteries. Wait, 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 what? Yeah, wait, 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 wait. he's a Christian. He's, wait, wait, he's still around? Still around. Still around. <laughs> and going, going on during this period of time. Are you guys learning a lot? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Leaving Constantinople, um, he eventually went back to her, spent so much time with her. He, so he thinks his whole history of his life is going back and forth, and he always ends up to Alexandria because uh, he loves her so very much. Uh, eventually, uh, Sneetheus becomes extremely important. He becomes a bishop of Ptolemaeus in 410. He received a dispensation, of course, to continue with his wife by his side. But even then, uh, um, he continued his patronage of Sneetheus. Uh, in fact, the funny thing is, Sneetheus then taught toleration of all Christians in his district, following what Hypatia said to him. So. He, he created a situation where uh, you had various schools within his district, and uh, he said, nope, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do uh, persecutions, we're toleration of all. Um, while holding this ecclesiastical post, Nietzsche never abandoned his Neoplatonic outlook of life, always seeing Theorea with, with the divine as the ultimate goal, stating at the time he was a bishop in one letter, quote, contemplation is the end and aim of the priesthood. Um, and so there you have it. He lived until 414, and then he, when he died in 415, she died. Are you getting the point? So he, his power, his prestige, in many ways protected her, because right? he was the bishop. Uh, Sneetheus was also a relative of another female philosopher, known as Odysseus, but we won't talk about that at this point. Okay, and we have other letters here. I'm looking at my time. Oh, good. Oh, uh, this is done at 9.30, right? Yeah. Is it the, is 9.30? 9, 9, 9, 30, yeah. Okay. Making sure of my time. <laughs> See how much. I, I, I got to have her get murdered, so I want to be sure I have much time I have. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, you know, I do have too much information on her. This is wonderful. Okay. So we have... Um, Let's get through all this. These are, I'm going through right now many of the letters of other people uh, that wrote about her and her kindness. And everybody loves her divine geometry course. That was, that was one of her best courses. So, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're a student, you're recommending a great course, you got to make sure you take her divine geometry one. Put that on your list. Uh, it's, it's not to be missed. Okay. Of course, we have a whole list of, of a whole bunch of other students. Uh, without doubt, the students of Hypatia not only greatly revered their teacher, using the most affectionate terms, but viewed themselves as always part of her community. Her family, whether they were physically together or not, making a pledge under her name to be true to one another. Also, most of these students of Hypatia arrived from wealthy backgrounds and went on to become either moderately or greatly successful, a few even entering the imperial circles. There is little evidence that anyone within the secular government ever disapproved of her, but much evidence that she was deeply valued by them to the point where Orestes, the new prefect of Egypt, arrived in Alexandria, and he immediately sought her advice and support. As for the religious background of her students, they appeared evenly mixed between pagans and Christians, revealing her teachings did not stir up any religious animosity between them, at least any from the surviving sources. In fact, 
for Christian students, Snethius included, praised Hypatia. As for Theophilus of Alexandria, the bishop, while he was known for his intolerance towards paganism and Christians who did not believe the same way as he did, even his cruelty during his entire tenureship as bishop, he never bothered Hypatia, permitted her to teach as she pleased. Right? The letters of Snethius to Hypatia are filled with literary quotations from Homer and Aristophanes, revealing she had a taste for both epics and playwrights. At one point, he attempted to send Hypatia his book entitled A Book on Hunting. This book was lost by certain young men who cared for Hellenism and grace. As for Snethius' letters to Hypatia, he addressed, he addressed her as follows. He called her in Epistle 10, a blessed lady. But more than that, Synethius time and again refers to literally as sacred, right down to her hands that received his letters. She appears to have this aura, this emanating energy of knowledge that was palpable to him in a very real and direct way. To Synethius, Hypatia had attained to a, quote, literal sainthood and divine spirit that had fallen on the master of Plato and later that of Plotinus, and from whom she became their holy font, but also, unquote, also a great philosopher in her own right. For one point, Snethius proclaims that she was, quote, a genuine guide in the mysteries of philosophy, unquote. The word genuine, by the way, uh, is not, is, it, does, it may only be, uh, only means authentic for understanding of the word, but actually means divine genius or spirit upon her, that there's a divine spirit that literally is upon her that moves from her to others. Uh, so Snethius also loves her tremendously. She is blessed by fortune and her words, right? Uh, she is a fortunate chorus that delights in her oracle utterances, her sacred words spoken in her divinely sweet voice. In this voice, these are all quotes, she is the most ineffable of ineffable things. You're learning things about, about the Hypatia you never knew. They saw her as the spirit indwelling through her that made her sacred. Her flesh was literally understood as sacred. And the whole menstruation conversation makes a little bit more sense now, doesn't it? That's fascinating, right? According to Synethius, Hypatia was all about following the words of Plotinus and said from his deathbed that true philosophers were, quote, to raise up the divine within you to the firstborn divine. As Synethius later reminded his friend Heraclinius, that which is called the luminous child of reason and the intellectual eye is the eye buried within us. Snethius wished that this moment of divine theoria would last forever. I should wish it to be the property of her nature to always be lifted up in the contemplation. But to attain to this theoria meant a constant sharpening in intellectual pursuits. Life lived according to reason is the end of men. Let us pursue that life. Let us ask for divine wisdom from God. Asnetheus was so loyal to Hypatia and her memory, never wavered from his thoughts while he was bishop, that he expressed a desire from Rome to abandon his post and be with her in Alexandria. In fact, he declared that he would always remember Hypatia even when he's in Hades. Epistle 124. <laughs> How's that for getting to know her? Are you, if you like to know her a little bit more, right? Uh, I actually have a lot more, but I, but I have to get to, uh, you know, what happened to her. But I do want you to understand that there is a whole lot of more, more information here. <clears throat> but here we go. Okay, so we got to keep going. <clears throat> oh, oh, there's one more thing. Okay. Uh, Snethius also makes it clear that Hypatia uh, integrated her teachings of philosophy with appreciation for Greek literature, as well as the importance of rhetoric, which was not often the trend of the day. Snethius writes to Hypatia, he says, some of those who wear the white or dark mantle have maintained that I am faithless 
in philosophy, apparently because I profess grace and harmony of style, and because I venture to say something concerning Homer and concerning the figure of the rhetoricians. In the eyes of such persons, one must hate literature in order to be a philosopher and must, and must occupy himself with divine matters only. No doubt these men alone have become spectators of the knowable. This privilege is unlawful for me, for I spend some of my leisure in purifying my tongue and sweetening my wit. Another remark uh, to Hypatia, he's, he says that there are certain men among my cities um, who only surpass by their ignorance and they're readiest of all to spit out discussions concerning God. Whenever you meet them, you have to listen to their babble. Um, they, they pour a torrent of phrases over those who stand in need of them. Uh, in which I suppose they find their own profit. The public teachers that one sees in our cities come from this class. It is very horn of Malathea, which they think themselves entitled to use. You will think, recognize these easily going tribe, which mis miscalls the ability of purpose. And it goes, goes going on and on. And of course, he says, you obviously agree with me and so forth. So she can't stand people who babble. And neither can he. So there you have it. So speaking of which, um, he, oh, here's here's also a whole such situation on the uh, Sneathius wishes to pass before Hypatia's judgment of a book he hoped to publish on the mysteries. Uh, he writes her, to her too. He who is not undisciplined to discover even a certain divine countenance hidden under a coarser model, like that of Aphrodite, those graces, and such charming divinities as the Athenian artists concealed within the sculpted figures of Silenius or the satire that man of all events will apprehend all my book has unveiled the mystic dogmas. And basically, he, he, tells, he tells her that you can approve of my book, and that will be great. But if you don't, uh, he says, uh, if it does not seem to you worthy of Greek ears, if like Aristotle, you prize truth more than friendship, a close and profound darkness will overshadow it, and mankind will never hear it mentioned. <laughs> so if you hate my work, you'll never hear from it again. There's so much. So, and that's that's not even half of it. So we're going to move to what happened to her, but I want to make it very clear. People have not done their research very well in Hypatia, right? If I am stuck still talking about her and all the details of her life, you got to realize we got to make another movie, right? We know so much about her. It's ridiculous. We, we kind of know more about her than a lot of people living at that time. We have all of this literature. But let's talk about what happened. Hopefully you'll give me the time to finish. I'm going to give you the three versions of what happened, and they are interesting. Okay. As for the fall of Hypatia from grace, this is, of course, uh, connected to a long and tragic story of Alexandrian religious politics of the era, uh, becoming a pawn in the ugly power play between Orestes governor of Egypt, and Cyro, the bishop of Alexandria, who replaced Theophilus. So Theophilus is no more. Cyro is in charge. It is quite literally a war between secular and church authority, with Hypatia caught in the middle. The bishop Theophilus died in 412, having never overtly opposed Hypatia and was replaced by Cyro of Alexandria as Patriarch of Alexandria, who was set upon doing so right from the beginning to oppose Hypatia. Cyro of Alexandria would dominate the bishopric from 412 all the way to 444. Immediately upon taking his seat upon the bishop's throne, Cyro began persecuting any Christians he deemed as heretics, especially the Novationists, According to Damascus in his life of Isidore, Cyro, the bishop of the opposing party, here's Cyro, the new guy, he went to Hypatia's house and noticed a great throng at her door, a jumble, a jumble of steeds and men. Some came, some went, others remained standing. Okay, she's pretty popular. So he's passing by her house and everybody's there. <laughs> They're waiting on her in patronage. He asked what this gathering meant and why such a tumult was being made. 
he then heard from his retainers that the philosopher Hypatia was being greeted, and that was her house. This information so pierced his heart that he launched a murderous attack in that most detestable manner, unquote. Now, obviously, this attack will come about in a little bit of time, but scholars are divided when Orestes became governor of Africa, using the official designation as prefect, anything from 412 to three years later, after Cyril came to rule in 415. Either way, Cyril, uh, the patriarch of Alexandria, viewed Orestes as a possible rival in power and set upon trying to assert himself against him. For he learned Orestes was both tolerant of the surviving pagans of the city and of the Jewish population. And Cyril had little patience for either group. While Orestes was a Christian, we know that he was only recently baptized in Constantinople before his appointment as governor of Egypt. So uh, he may have still retained or perceived to have retained some of his pagan upbringing. Socrates Scholasticus, who is a contemporary, Socrates Scholasticus, who is a contemporary, meaning he lived at the same time as Hypatia, makes it very clear that Orestes consulted with Hypatia on a regular basis. And these meetings were not simply regarding her field of philosophy, but she was asked questions related to the running of the local government and on politics. <laughs> she was his advisor <laughs> for the political matters of Alexandria. From Cyro's point of view, she may be considered obviously a political threat, right? Note that we do not have any documentation about Orestes coming to him for advice. <laughs> Orestes didn't go uh, to the to patriarch of, 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 of Alexandria for, for advice. He went to he went to Hypatia. Now Orestes, the Roman governor of Alexandria, and Cyro, the bishop of Alexandria, became embroiled in a war of egos and beliefs in 415 over how to handle Jewish celebrations in the city, especially the dancing shows, which became an alluring attraction for both Jews and Greeks alike, creating crowds that often resulted in troublesome public disturbances and even riots. So these uh, these Jewish dancing dancing people, girls and so forth, a little risque. <laughs> Let's put it that, that way. In fact, what happens is this. So Orestes wrote up a decree that established certain rules of conduct to be followed by all and had it posted on the theater wall. So let's have some dignity. When the decree was read, the general public disapproved of the measure. Come on, Orestes, you're no fun. All except one person. The person who liked what Orestes wrote about maybe censoring these uh, these. Uh, uh, these uh, these dances uh, happened to be a person who was a supporter of his rival Cyro, and he said, "Oh, wow, this is great! Yes, these women should be censored." And kept going on and on, and of course, obviously, started a riot. And so that was a riot, okay, going on. Orestes realized that uh, this guy, uh, his name is Herax by name. Uh, must be working with Cyro to stir up the crowds. And so he realized he'd been played. And so he takes Hyrax and he arrests him and he takes him to the theater and has him tortured. Now Cyro goes, you tortured my guy. <laughs> this is my guy, Hyrax. How dare you persecute Christians? Now the Jews of Alexandria then feel threatened because what happens is that Cyro says, well, um, because part of the riot involved Jews, uh, he's going to go ahead and persecute the Jews. So the Jews of the city, then what happens, according to the story, run through the streets of Alexandria, claiming that the great church of Alexandria is on fire. And then, of course, people come out, and as they come out, the, the Greeks come out, there's a big fight. In the end, what happens is that Saro uses this excuse to throw out all the Jews from Alexandria, and they never return. So they use this as an excuse. 
Well, of course, uh, Orestes is pretty upset because the Jews of the, of the city supported him. Uh, they were many of his supporters. Now he lost the supporters. Kind of clever when you think about it. So basically, Orestes makes something unpopular, uh, makes, makes a proclamation. Somebody from Cyrus' group approves it, which nobody should approve it because it's, it's not really a degree. Start the riot. It involves the Jews. Are you guys following along? <laughs> and eventually, of course, uh, 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 Orestes knows it's a ruse. Uh, he, he, he beats up the guy who was part of the plot. And then, of course, he gets accused of attacking Christians. And meanwhile, because the Jews were involved, uh, fearing that they're going to be attacked, then they're kicked out of the city. Done. So you can see uh, pretty complex. Well, Cyro decided now he's going to make peace with Orestes. It declares him to be a fellow Christian. He's like, let's be friends. <laughs> so Cyro said, hey, let's be friends and let's get along. Can't we all get along? In fact, um, uh, declares him to be a fellow Christian and shows how the Gospels made them on the same side. Cyro, of course, is evil. Meanwhile, 500 monks from the mountains of Nitria, who were of, quote, a fiery disposition, came down to Alexandria to fight on Cyrus' side and attacked Orestes' chariot and declared him to really be a pagan idolater and not a Christian at all. So basically, this is all a ruse. Right? One of the monks, uh, by the name of Ammonius, threw a rock at Orestes' head, injuring him badly, and as blood, uh, of course, ran over the soil. As Orestes was being assaulted, his personal guard fell away, but the people of Alexandria came to his rescue, fighting back the Nitrian monks, and then Ammonius was brought to justice, duly tortured for his offense, and died shortly as a result. But Cyril then declared him a martyr, which he wasn't, and also that he's persecuting Christians. Orestes is persecuting Christians. Now he's Losing, of course, at this point, I do have to say that Cyro is losing credibility. Losing credibility. And so he's now going to the lowest level. He's going to say, no, really, Orestes is a pagan. I can prove it. He listens and consults with Hypatia. There we go. All that to get to Hypatia. <laughs> uh, I, you thought our you thought our politics were complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now what happens is that Hypatia becomes a target. If she was not a Christian, how could a Christian like Orestes take advice from her? Perhaps Orestes was also really not a Christian either, or was maybe maybe she was poisoning his mind with her pagan philosophy. So Cyril convinced many Christians using this faulty logic, and they kidnapped Hypatia, led by Peter the Reader. Don't name any kid Peter the Reader, sorry. <laughs> Peter the Reader, who was specifically called a fanatic by Socrates Scholasticus. So next, they took Hypatia to the church called Caesarea. Then they completely stripped her and then murdered her with tiles. She was then mutilated and burned. And so Hypatia, according to the contemporary uh, Socrates Scholasticus, fell, quote, victim to the political jealousy that at the time prevailed, unquote. But he adds, quote, surely nothing can be farther from the spirit of Christianity than the allowance of massacres, fights, and transactions of that sort, unquote. It's not in the spirit of Christianity. In fact, rather than celebrations, as a result of this, Cyril was condemned for his brutal actions. The spin would come later. Is this interesting? So let's go. Two more sources. We're almost done. This is, these are shorter. Another version of Hypatia's demise survives from Damascus in his life of Isidore. And this person, he lived 100 years later, but he is a great source. And this source also seems to not contradict Socrates Scholasticus. It just gives more of the story. Okay, so it's not a contradiction. 
There's no real spin. Uh, he says, for when Hypatia was going out as usual, several bestial men, fearing neither divine vengeance nor human punishment, suddenly rushed upon her and killed her, thus laying her country under the highest of infamy and under the guilt of innocent blood. Under the guilt of innocent blood. Still, a hundred years later, she's viewed as innocent. And indeed, the emperor, Theodosius II, not to be confused with Theodosius I, the emperor was grievously offended at that matter. And the murderers had certainly been punished. Okay, but the Adasius did corrupt the emperor's friends so that his majesty, it is true, remitted the punishments, but drew vengeance upon himself and posterity, his nephew paying dearly for his action. Now the emperor reference here is Theodosius II, uh, who ruled from the death of Arcadius from 408 to 450. But at that time, Hypatia's death was 415. He was still considered too young to rule, and so was under a regency of Anathemius. But uh, what happened is apparently the young Theodosius, only 14 at the time, initially wanted to condemn this action, as did his sister Pocrea. And one could only imagine the horrified reaction of the new Praetorian prefect who took Anathemus's place also, a certain Aurelia by name, who was a close friend of Hypatia's friend, Synethius. <laughs> it's a small world after all. They're all connected. They're all friends. So this, what I'm trying to say is, Hypatia is condemned. Is that sorry? Hypatia is not being condemned. Cyril of Alexandria is being condemned. Everybody's upset about about Hypatia. Now they're they're going to send a representative by the name of Odysseus to check out what went on in Alexandria. So they actually sent an envoy out to check it out. The sources get a little bit muddled, but they're going to investigate. Theodosius II is going to investigate the murder of Hypatia. Have you guys ever heard about this before? No, I know. This is the fun of going into primary sources. <laughs> yeah, no. So it's, they're under investigation. This is horrifying for, for them. So Odysseus did determine the lay brethren who did this were too powerful and posed a danger and decided that they were to be forbidden to appear in public assemblies and the games and their numbers were greatly reduced. And then on top of that, they put the power, the full political power of the city and the area under the administration of the prefect of Egypt, and that is Orestes himself. Orestes won. Hypatia was viewed uh, as this innocent victim. Cyro looks really bad, and his band of monsters were condemned. Wow. Hey, maybe justice. But then what happens is that Orestes blows it. He is so upset and so hurt and s about the loss of his friend that he doesn't want the job anymore, and he quits. Don't quit, Orestes. He quits. And as a result, Cyro is allowed to gain power again. And then he starts working his spin. But I want you to know, at the time of her death, she is judged as innocent. Cyro and the others are judged as guilty. And this is looked at in the whole Christian world as an abomination. Wow. So, one last part. It's called the spin. The spin arrives. Uh, his name is John of Nikio. And he brings up Hypatia. And his story happens way later. Okay, so John of Nikio is writing in the seventh century. Okay, where intellectual pursuits, especially pagan philosophy, was readily condemned, right? So, so basically, uh, this negative view of Hypatia arrives 200 years 
after her life. 200 years. And so it's time to create a story. John of Nicaea claimed that Hypatia encouraged the Egyptian prefect Orestes to abandon going to church and to become her student. And furthermore, he then influenced others to leave the church and join them all in philosophical discussions at his, at his house. While such house discussions were certainly possible, as a public official living in Christian Alexandria, he would uh, have these kinds of visits. Uh, still, this is reviewed 200 years as reckless. Uh, of course, Cyril of Alexandria sent Hyrax, remember him? A Christian possessing understanding and intelligence, really? <laughs> to discover the cause of the public outcry of Orestes meeting with Hypatia. And so he became the merely, merely the messenger rather than the cause of the riot. When Hyrax read the edict and approved, this account says that the Jews believed he was being sarcastic, told Orestes, who had him tortured for a crime he was wholly guiltless of. The entire episode of the 500 Nitrian monks beating up Orestes was um, left out of the account. Uh, and of course, Orestes uh, is shown as encouraging everybody to defy the bishop, which of course is not mentioned in Scholasticus' account. The Jews then plot to, to destroy Alexandria itself. Uh, and this is the reason why, you know, so there's anti-Semitism that's thrown in. At this point, John and Nicio brings Hypatia saying that Peter the magistrate, as opposed to Peter the reader, led the multitudes of believers in God against Hypatia. <laughs> Perhaps he got a promotion. Next, this crowd proceeded to seek, I'm quoting, for the pagan women who had been beguiled the people of the city and the prefect through her enchantments, as opposed to walking home in Scholasticus' version. She is found sitting in a chair and then she is kidnapped. The account continues telling how they dragged her along until they brought her to the great church named Caesarean. Now this was in the days of the fast, and they tore off her clothes and dragged her through the streets of the city till she died, and they carried her to the place known as Samarian, and they burned her body in fire. In celebration, Silo of, Cyro of Alexandria was declared, quote, the new Theophilus, and at last, pagan idolatry was at an end. The end, the credits go up. This account is basically a lie, <laughs> a complete lie, twisted. Socrates Scholasticus, a contemporary, his version, yes, that's, a, that's what happened, right? So that is uh, exactly what happened. Very clear, and she is innocent in all ways. Uh, Damascus, right, 100 years later, uh, who had... Uh, who was using the imperial treasury when it comes to sources. He's a good scholar. hundred years later, Hypatia is still innocent. Cyro is still the bad guy and also tells us of, of the imperial investigation into her murder. It's only 200 years later where we get the John of Nikio version. How's that? So this changes things tremendously for your understanding of Hypatia. This means that we have to redo uh, Agora and we have to show all this in the version where it turns out that you have a few really bad fanatics with a very little in the way of support causing disturbances throughout Alexandria and they're the ones who demonized Hypatia. But for the majority of the people of Alexandria, she was innocent. She was wonderful. She was a great advisor. And she was highly respected by all, not only during her time, but 100 years later. The legacy of Hypatia, truly a great woman of her time. Thank you. So, did you guys enjoy that? Yes. So, does that change your mind a little bit about Hypatia now? Oh, I wish I could share all the other stuff. But um, uh, don't you think we need another book 
Um, don't you think we need to have another movie of her life? <laughs> I think we've noticed, though, when, when Christians do, do something really, really horrendous, everybody always says, even this far back, oh, that's not what real Christians are like. That's not what real Christians do. And they're still saying it, and they're still doing it. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. 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 What happened? Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Savannah, so another comment? I'm going to have to take off soon. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed the lecture. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions about Hypatia? Yeah. Open up a whole can of worms, right? No, no, right? How did her father I, die? Huh? Yeah. Old age. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he didn't get ensnared in all these politics because it happened after his death. No, no. And, and I think it's interesting that uh, she thrived during one of the heaviest persecution of pagans in Alexandria. During that time, she's able to easily go up into the assembly of men and talk with them. She's the height of her fame during the persecutions. And she was a pagan. And she had, as her students, both Christians, pagans, as well as Jews. And they all considered themselves a family. And as a family, to, to esteem one another, uh, to love one another, uh, and to, to be apart from this world. And they pertain, of course, to these mysteries, this, this, this mysteries of theosis, of becoming one with God through contemplation. Christians, pagans, and Jews alike. Yeah. The philosophy you were describing was really Gnostic to me. There's a Gnostic aspect to it. Yeah, it sounded yeah. like the tripartite part, the... Yeah. Yeah. Lot of it. Yep, it pertains to that as well. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's knowledge is important. Yeah, she did have mysteries, and of course, people swore by the seal of Hypatia, so we don't know what those mysteries are. Uh, she did use uh, various mechanical devices that she made, which are referred in the letters of Sinetius, uh as part of these rites. So adds a little bit more uh, curiosity. So we don't know what these are all about, these mechanisms. But she really uh, crosses over her ideas. She's basically a Neoplatonist. She really is, the Iamblichus type. She's a Neoplatonist that, that uh, integrates a little bit of Neoplatonian ideas here and there, as you saw from her recommended reading list. Uh, at the same time, a little bit of the Hermetic writings, uh, Orphic Mysteries, and why not a little Gnosticism thrown in for good measure? So uh, really a synthesis of so many different ideas. But during this period of time, in late antiquity, this is what happens. So many ideas, uh, even from a Julian, uh, the emperor, we have his writings, which I've read, I have here, I'm right back, right there they are. Uh, uh, Julian, um, uh, we know that he had a composite belief system too that brought in all these ideas as one. So it was very common have elements of Gnosticism thrown in uh, to uh, a form of, of Neoplatonism. I can actually go on forever on this one. But, uh, but the difference is Gnosticism sees the world, the material world, as completely evil, right? But she didn't see it as evil. She just saw it as mundane and not of the good. So that's, that's the basic, that's the difference there. So she didn't see the world as the material is evil. She thought it as lower, like as, as you know, when she showed off her menstrual blood, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, the material is, is not to be strived after. It's, we're supposed to strive after the spiritual uh, and contemplate that uh, through various signs and symbols, which is another topic that I can bring up about her too. Uh, this is all in various writings. Any other questions? Right. A man that you described as being drawn and quartered during the first third of your lecture, who was that? Drawn and quartered? Are you talking about hierarchs? Wait, oh, the first third. I couldn't figure out if you're talking about a statue from the church or if oh, it was... Oh, the Serapion. Uh, the, 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 the statue of Serapis, the god. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's in the temple of Serapis. Okay. They call him the old man. I see. And they burned him, tore him apart. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other any other thoughts? When Respect. you said that killed her with tiles, do you mean did they basically stone her to death? 
Well, uh, when you take a look at the Greek, it seems like almost like roof tiles. So which could be sharp. So you're going to have other versions where it will say that her skin was peeled off by, oh. by tiles or shells. No yeah, secrets. I heard it was seashells that they broke and then it was like making cuts in her skin and then peeling yeah. the flesh. It was yeah, you'll have, other cell, you'll have other sources that will say that. But mm -hmm. um, um, I translated the word as tiles. So there's going to be, yeah, so and that's sharpened tiles. Although you could have seashells. I mean, it is Alexandria after all. But um, uh, oftentimes they would... Uh, Alexandria was, was, was known as the tiled city. Uh, Julius Caesar and others made comments on the fact that nothing would burn down because everything was out of tiles. You know, all the roofs were out of tiles. And so they have plenty of tiles. And archaeologists always run into piles and piles and piles. Believe me, there can be a lot of tiles, but they're, they're pretty sharp, uh, especially when they break. So... But um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Anika. First of all, thank you so much for this inspiring talk. Thank and, you. And perhaps you said it, and I really, really didn't notice. But did she ever teach female students as well? This is uh, this is the unfortunate part, is that there is some circumstantial evidence that she is connected to Adesius who was the philosopher uh, at that time, but that link has not been made. So it appears that the majority of the students that we know of happen to be male, which is again, very fascinating that she is a female over all these males and she's viewed as, uh, as an authority figure over them. Yeah, I know, I wish, I, would, I you know, I was going through the list, I was hoping for a female name too. Let's, please, let's have, you know, this legacy carried on by other female philosophers and, and so forth. Um, there is evidence that Snethius' wife was very much a part of this philosophy. Um, and, um, and what happened is he became a bishop and they wanted, uh, they're starting to get weird about people having wives. And uh, he, he fought against this. And so he was able to retain his wife. And his wife was very much wanting, you know, to be a part of that. She was also a thinker. Uh, uh, so it's possible that, uh, well, I mean, and she was always in their home. So I wouldn't call her a follower, but uh, indirectly, she was part of the philosophy, but uh, not officially. Okay. All right. I, w I wish. Thank you. Great question, though. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Any other questions? Please, please, any questions. I can take it. Any others? Okay, impressions. Uh, what did you feel, what surprised you? Name, uh, somebody name one thing that surprised you about this talk that you learned. Maybe something that you had not heard before. I was surprised by the amount of contemporary material that you have. Yeah. I've never, never even uh, crossed my mind that there would be a, a bunch of that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that great? Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Uh, you can easily get your copy of Socrates Scholasticus uh, and uh, get uh, Snethius and a few of the other, the letters that would be recommended by the other students. Some are pretty hard to get a hold of. Not all translated in English, but um, I think you'll find some Snethius, maybe not all of his letters, but um, yeah, and we have others too, other 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 writers at that time. Um, it was a literary era in the later fourth century, so that's good. Uh, thank you, Anika, for being here. Uh, you know, so thank you. And, and she's in Berlin, so uh, that's our yes, welcome uh, archaeologist from Berlin. So. All right. All right, next. Anybody else? Any other thing that we learned? I guess I was surprised by how thoroughly someone's name can be dragged through the mud hundreds of years later to fit someone else's agenda. Yeah. It should not surprise me, but uh, somehow it always does. Yep. And it's, it's John that talks about the fact that she was doing witchcraft and magic and all these evil things. You know, it's like, and nobody, 
uh, enchantments we find, in, you know, she's accused of, and Socrates Scholasticus mentions that, you know, obviously Cyril did that, but not even to that extent. But by two centuries later, during the time of John, Nikyu, it's kind of like, ugh. We, he, she's not around, nobody is around from that time. We can use this as a rhetorical advice. And they used it, number one, to demonize her and paganism, saying this is the end of idolatry. And number two, unfortunately, to support anti-Semitism. It's very anti-Semitic. Mm. Uh, this is the end of the, of the Jews living in Alexandria. And two centuries later, unfortunately, you're going to see anti-Semitism uh, very much a part of this, this, of this, this conversation. And it's despicable that Christians uh, went to this level of not only attacking uh, pagans, but attacking Jews, too. So it's a two-in-one terrible special. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other parts that stood out? Just always curious to see what people are thinking. Anything else you didn't know? Would she have been considered Egyptian or Alexandrian, or how did they... Was she Greek and Egyptian, or uh, she? She is. She is considered uh, Greek, uh, living in Alexandria. Huh. So, so, but she did participate, uh, and and had people who were Egyptians that were part of her company. So there's there's groups that are from the Thebod and other areas that were uh, native Egyptians that were that were uh, her students. So uh, I skipped the, the three pages of all her students, where they're from, and their letters to her. So I just, I thought Sneetheus was the easiest. But uh, yeah, we have other correspondence. This is fun, huh? Uh, and other sources, too. So, but uh, yeah. Uh, she had quite a few. But, she, but, but most of them were wealthy. So, and they moved into the very high circles, in, including the very, the top, most imperial circles. So he had friends in high places. But uh, Sneetheus died in 414. I think he's nearby in Serini. And I think that uh, she lost a little bit of protection also at that point. And so um, and Cyril felt like, well, maybe this is the time to, to do what he did. I'm just disappointed in Orestes. You know, I think Orestes, after all that investigation, he's been, you know, he's validated and he's given all this power. I guess I have to feel sorry for him. He's, I just can't take it anymore and he quit. You know, I'm tired of the, I guess I can empathize. He's tired of the bloodshed. He's tired of the riots. You know, it's a fearic victory. You know, he knows that he's, it's going to be lost in the end anyway. Uh, and um, he just, he just sails off. Still would be a great movie. So how I would see it is the movie starts with the investigation. Wouldn't that be good? You know, uh, I see it now as, as, as um, Hypatia has already been murdered uh, and, uh, and uh, Theodosius uh, the second and the, the court, they're all upset and word spread all throughout the Roman Empire and they sent the representative in to investigate to see what happens. And then it goes, and then the investigation uh, powers the rest of the narrative, you know? Who was she, you know? Uh, and, and discover piece by, wouldn't that be a great movie? Starting off that way. Uh, and I think that would be a, a, a easy sell. And then, it's, then of course, let's say, well, let's go back to her past. And then you, you, you zoom back to the past and it's the first 10 years of her life and she's seen all this bloodshed in Alexandria, uh, you know, you know, big Christians. And then he's, she's seen all the bloodshed between pagans and Christians, and she thinks to herself, I want to stay away from all this. I want to have, to move beyond this, I want to have a family of people who believe and love one another. You know, and it doesn't matter if you're Christian or you're pagan or you're Jew, right? And she does that. And she, she does that in the middle of a time of persecution. She creates the school and it thrives and it's not persecuted. That to me is miraculous. Yeah, it's amazing. Guys, that she died what, 65? 60. No? Mm -hmm. 60? Well, born of eight, uh, see, uh, she's born in 350. So. That was one thing I saw 370 or 350. 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's talk about that. I, I went through this, and it's three fifty. It's three fifty. Yeah. I have a whole section on that, uh, going going through it, about uh, uh, in the in the in her editing of the writings of Theon, and when she did this editing, uh, and then corresponding historical events that are happening at that time, uh, and it it gets rid of the three seventy five pretty quick. I know. I think it, I think it's better. I mean, you know, that she's, you know, older and that she's survived for this long. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, people like the 375. Maybe they want a younger actress. I don't know. But There was a movie about her, but it wasn't very good, apparently. I haven't seen it. It's great. I love it. I, I, you know, I, it got panned, didn't it? I don't know. I, I love the movie. I mean, I still, I still love Agora. It's a great movie. I just wish it was correct. That's why I heard it wasn't good because it wasn't correct. Well, yeah, but but yeah, there's unfortunately there hasn't been a correct version that I've ever. I mean, a lot of the books I have are not even correct. It's it's very upsetting. You need and, to uh, write and, a. You need to uh, write a book. You need yeah, to write the book. I know. Yeah, me with all my time. <laughs> <laughs> so so, but uh, maybe somebody else can write it. But I can give the sources. You know? And Jen suggested play. that you write the screenplay. You want the movie? You should write the movie. I think we should have a screenplay. Hmm? I think the movie would sell. Yeah, I think so. Especially too. now. Because uh, I skipped a whole bunch of sections. We're talking about constant riots and going on. <laughs> it's, it looks like today, you know, fights and protests and everything else. Uh, you know, Alexandria was not the place to be. Uh, walk safely in the streets because there's always. Uh, people uh, that were rioting or burning something down. So, but um, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they even burned down their own city a few times. Just mm. why not? But um, <clears throat> no, I think it'd be a great screenplay. I, I, I do think that it does contribute to uh, knowledge of women in antiquity. And, um, and I would say that it, it breaks the stereotypes because she's not the only one. Uh, another talk at some time I'll do, although I, I told Terry about this, I, but I need to do more research, is there's another mystic famous female, her name is Sasapatra, uh, who is a, who, of, of the fourth century. And we have a lot of material on her too, who's another great philosopher. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you, have, uh, you have the three Cappadocians, but really they're the four Cappadocians, because Macrinia, uh, uh, who is the sister uh, of, of, of Basil the Great and Greg, Gregory uh, of, of, of Nyssa, uh, uh was known f uh, to be the one who taught many of them their ideas in the first place. And who says that? They do. <laughs> so she's a great Christian philosopher, again, from the fourth century. What was so, her name? Uh, Macrinia, M-A-C-R-I-N-A. -A. And Sosipatra is another one, very pagan uh, from Ephesus. S O S I P I T R A. Uh, so yeah, there's there's there's, there's, a, there's a few in the third century, and there's so many. Um, and I, I really think that somebody should write a book on female philosophers of antiquity. A class, right? Yeah. yeah, because we got to realize that Socrates and uh, Plato uh, both interacted with female philosophers. Diatima being one. Is this interesting, right? Would women of her time, of Hypatia's time, been formally educated in this way or not commonly? It depends. It really depends on where you're at and what circles you run in. If you are of the elite, then you're going to learn how to read and write. And you'll, you'll be able to philosophize. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, in many cases, we find from letters from the fourth century, that uh, even when it comes to marriage, many men wanted to have their wives uh, being able to have conversations with them in a philosophical, it sounds like patri patriarchy, but still, they want to have wives who understand what they do uh, and love philosophy and talking with them as well. I know, like I said, it, it doesn't sound like, hey, that, I, want, I want to hear that, but still, it, it tells you that, oh, it was, it was a virtue. Uh, again, we're back to Julian. Julian uh, mentioned that as well, uh, it, you know, Good to have. It's virtuous to train both men and women in philosophy. Yeah. 
So it's it's not like the Middle Ages or other times where oh you can't you can't teach about this, right? You can't teach them that. Uh, during the Greek and Roman times, they go, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, why not? You know, what percentage of their society was like middle class or upper class that would have. Well, and of course, yeah. The problem is, is what is middle class? What is upper class? What is lower class in ancient times? And we go into this slippery slope. Um, uh, also, when it comes to uh, the ability to read, uh, because literacy is problematic because you have people who know how to read and write, but you have also a lot of people who don't know how to read and write, but they have access to literacy because people constantly read everything out loud, and so they know the same stuff that the people who do read because they are listening. <laughs> and people had better memories in those days, so they're able to memorize things right off. And so... You're gonna have you can have a really erudicious conversation uh, about philosophy and all these different ideas with somebody who doesn't know how to read, and yet they are they are part of literacy. They're participants in it. So, and this is happens a lot of male philosophers as well as uh, others. Of course, can I poke fun of uh, Augustine? Augustine didn't know how to read Greek. There, I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Who says so? Augustine <laughs> and his confessions on two different occasions. Yeah, so he only knows Latin. So, so from the perspective of many of his contemporaries, he is unread because he doesn't know Greek. He hated his Greek teacher. He didn't want to be. He didn't want to be near him. He loved his Latin teacher. So he again confesses. That's why it's the confessions. The fact that he doesn't know it, which kind of has, has problems when it comes uh, to his understandings of the Bible because he can't read it in the original language. So he knows a Latin version, but uh, so but even he was looked at as unread by many of his contemporaries because he didn't know both Latin and Greek. Wow. So so good a person who is truly literate knows Latin and Greek. If you don't know both, you're not really literate. <laughs> I'll look for professor. Huh? Yeah, what? I had a professor who fervently believed that also. Yeah. Well, I, very I don't believe that, but that's what they believe. Yeah, <laughs> that's you know, that's the, the, the snooty upper class of the Romans. You know, you got to know your Greek too. Um, and the Roman emperors are pride of themselves of knowing the Greek. Uh, and then, of course, you have a few Roman emperors that try to fake it, and didn't go off very well. Uh, I feel sorry for poor Trajan; his Greek was terrible, uh, and. Um, and but he loved the way uh, a sophist by the name of Favoronius of Arles spoke, and uh, he sat there for hours, loving the way he spoke. And he made a comment. He said, "I love the way you speak. Too bad I don't understand what you're saying." <laughs> so you know, but, but Hadrian uh, knew his Greek as well as Latin. Uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and of course, obviously Marcus Aurelius. You know, so most of the emperors, well, not Maximinus Thrax didn't know anything. He knew only Latin and uh, Danubian Latin at that. But yeah, hmm. too much information. I got to stop. <laughs> but uh, any other kinds of questions uh, on? Uh, but that's a great, great one. No, no. All right. Oh wait, so we had a question. Wait, wait. Oh. All right, we're going to close this chapter. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you got, uh, uh, you, you came here and you received what you wanted. And maybe your curiosity has sparked a little bit. Uh, maybe you wanted a little bit more investigations. Uh, and I think that would be good. But I also want to make sure that we leave with the understanding that Hypatia, during her time, by the majority of the people, was considered innocent and a great figure. It was just a few bad people, and they were condemned for doing it. And everything else is revisionism. Okay. All right. Have All a right. good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Can I stop?